This has popped up all over my feed. This is the new Riot Games cinematic. Its name is still here. Okay, and I'll be honest with you. Spot my Spotify literally told me that I was in the top 0.01% of League of Legends listeners in terms of how frequently I listen to it. I listened to Awaken over 400 times last year. That's almost over, that's over once a day. <laughs> Actually crazy. And that was just Awaken. I listen to Riot Games music all the time. So my hope with this is that I can add another song to my soundtrack because I've been listening to the same 10 songs for the last three years. Tomorrow is a hope. Never a promise. If Evelyn is in this, I'm gonna lose my shit. I want Evelyn. My boy Trendamere. Alton spin through it. God, it's so good. This is what makes Riot Games lore so good is they connect it to their cinematics so cleanly, bro. So cleanly. Aatrox 1VXing, by the way, at the Baron Pit. just watching this shit bro it's so good as a league of legends player for seven years so fucking good yeah it's morgana yeah oh shit is that yasuo where's the sword kind of looks real What they didn't show here was the seven times he died before this trying to save that same kid. This is the eighth time he's come back. He's 0-7, but now he's 2-7. Two, two he hit the power spike, boys. Oh, shit. Now you've done it. I'm still here. Yasuo main ever right there. I can split the arrow in half. Come back from respawn, big dog. We got this one. You know, motherfuckers saw this and were like, it's time to keep. Time to go queue some Yasuo and solo queue, boys. Avoid for the next week. Avoid for the next week. Trend in my, my favorite, my favorite lore in League is the Freljord. By far, the Freljord. I love this. Oh my god, it's Kindred! You 
can't you can't get this close to Trinomir. You can't get a motherfucker. You, you're gonna fuck around and find out today. You know a true kindred main when they refer to themselves is they. doesn't know ash and trindamere are married in the lore actually married in the war that that that's how i knew when the arrows missed i was like oh my god those are frost arrows that's ash bro that's sick that's sick and just in time for my league of legends arc i want to point out that they dropped this right as the preseason for league of legends is starting up these motherfuckers know how to hype a game up these guys know plus i can add a new song to my playlist that's right. New song for the playlist. Here's the video right here, boys. If you somehow haven't seen it yet. Although, uh, it premiered two days ago. It has 37 million views. It had 15 million views in the first 12 hours. Crazy. Crazy, dude. I wish we got cinematics even half this good for BDO. On God. I wish we even got anything half this good look at the interactions you have you have kale and morgana everyone wants to see their character in the cinematic and to be clear evelyn's in it too look she's right there i love league of legends cinematics okay she's been in everyone but like having morgana and kale Right? And then they're fighting Aatrox, which is like a huge fucking crazy fight. Um, the Yasuo one. Now we have a Boomer Yasuo skin. And they also get to tease their own skins for the game. Right? They also get to tease their own skins. Which is crazy. Actually just crazy. You got Kindred up in here. The Ash Arrows go huge. I'm still here! The volley goes hard. The volley goes hard. I also love this is huge. Because he's raging, right? He's in rage right there. And then and then the queen shows up. And she chills. She cools him off. That's sick. It's the level of detail. It's so sick, bro. And you can see, oh god, if you look really closely, you can actually see there's still enemies closing in. So the hawk shot did actually see people. Ah, bro, so good. Just so fucking good. Did you play the game after the new map changes and the jungle changes? Uh, jungle lane changes. I have not played it yet. I have a League of Legends arc starting in like the next week or so. Uh, I, have, I have to play League of Legends on stream because that's what people wanted me to do for um, my subathon. So that's what we're going to do. I have reached out to the appropriate parties and we are setting it up. You guys are going to get the League of Legends Blue Squadron arc. I promise you, I'm a, I was a Diamond League jungler back in the day. I'm washed, but we'll pick it up quick again. We're going to be fine. Uh, how long is this video? It's 30 minutes? Okay. If you watch the new Still Here cinematic and you thought to yourself, that was oh, this, cool. Okay, Necrit is goaded. To be clear, this is like the League of Legends lore guy. This is like your guy. Okay. Um... Like this is this is this dude is who you go to, and I just want to point out he does this uh, in his pajamas, uh, so you know he's legit. I still have no idea what happened. You would not be alone, and that's most likely. Uh, Kindred is kind of a hard champion, yeah. 
because you don't know the ins and outs of League's lore. Which I can assure you is totally normal, most people are too lazy to read. And it just so happens to be that not only is still here our first leak cinematic that is fully canon from the get-go, mm -hmm. but also the cinematic is an absolute love letter to League's lore community. Because it is not only full of interesting details, but it is also overflowing with lore references. So no matter if you wonder why Kale and Morgana look different, why Yasuo is old now, or if you don't even play League and you just saw a cool cinematic and you wanna learn about it, this video should help with that. So let's explain what exactly happened in League's newest cinematic, still here. Right at the beginning you can hear a quote. Tomorrow is a hope, never a promise. Which came from... That's Kindred, yeah. I was gonna say, I hear that when I lock in Kindred. Uh, that, that's like the lock in, uh, I know because I'm a jungle main, so I, I've locked in Kindred many times. Kindred, who are the twin deathly spirits, also known as the Lamp and the Wolf, who very simply put, in League's universe, represent death. They are sort of like the Grim Reaper. Correct. After which the cinematic starts with a cut into the Freljord, where after a fierce battle shown by the number of soldiers scattered around, the barbarian king Trindamir was finally brought to his knees. His enemies are most likely the Wintersclaw tribe. Because as you'll see, this entire scene happens in the present times. In the second shot you can see that his very iconic helmet had fallen off. You can actually see it here in the cinematic. After which... Uh, I, I didn't even notice that. Trindomir... <laughs> Probably because like normally you, you're you're playing with a Trindomir skin. Typically it's the demon Trindomir skin because that one's goaded. Trindomir looks up at the brink of his strength and he sees the faint silhouette of a figure with a bow. Of course, this is referencing the lamb, indicating that death had come for him. Though, as you'll see later, there is more than one twist to this. In the next scene, we actually travel to the past. Specifically, here we can see ancient... Is that a lamb? Yeah, Kindred represents a lamb. Again, lamb and wolf. ...and Demacia. This was after Demacia was founded as a safe haven from magic, but before the nation became a haven for racists against magic. Since most of the really bad hatred was fueled by the conflict between Kale and Morgana, which would happen later. I do want to point out, people were saying that Morgana is not the fallen angel. They're not an angel. She's not a... She's literally called Morgana the fallen angel. Shut up. This also means that at this I point, I didn't get that out of nowhere. has not progressed that far with the research of Petricide which is the pale stone that can absorb magic. And at Yeah, so an important thing to understand about League's lore, guys, is that it's always, like, morally ambiguous. Demacia seems like the super good guys. They're always about justice and truth, and they enslave magic users and uh, are super racist. Uh, so, like, this... <laughs> um, and then you have Noxus, who is, like, this kingdom of, like, like death and, like, war and destruction... But, like, their motto is strength above all. So, like, the theme there being that, like, you could be you could be born a very poor person and still be, like, very successful in that kingdom because you're just strong. As a result, if you look at the buildings here, you can see they do not resemble the white buildings just yet. Another thing to point out here is the Sea of Dead Soldiers. Yeah. At first sight, you might think that all of these are ancient Demacians who just got slaughtered by the Darkin demigod Aatrox. But that's not entirely the truth. Now, for the sake of simplicity, I am not going to explain what the Darkin are. Just know that they are corrupted, power-hungry demigods. But we have to mention something for an important detail that happens later. The Darkin are demigods wielding blood magic who got banished inside their weapons. And in Aatrox... I hate Kane. I just, on a side note, fuck Kane. That is all. In this case, he was bound inside his greatsword. The body you can see here is actually the body of a mortal who picked up the weapon. After which Aatrox transformed them and dominated their mind. You will see that this will get cool in just a moment. Anyway, next, as the scene cuts to Kale and Morgana. For only half a second, you can see that Morgana dropped a soldier. She almost disrespectfully threw him to the ground, which indicates that the soldier was not an ancient Demacian, but rather it was an enemy. So Aatrox didn't do all of this alone. 
which would make sense because the Darkin, such as Aatrox, used to build their own warbands of mortals by either enslaving them or by turning them into worshippers who believed they were gods. This was especially common during the Great Darkin Wars. Though this entire scene. Okay, I did not know this. That's actually kind of crazy. I actually didn't even know that Kale and Morgana were Nessus or sisters. Scene is happening after that. So these barbaric marauders were just Aatrox's followers who attacked Demacia. After this, the scene shows us the early version of the Demacian armor. You can see they are yet to reach their glorious design with petricide steel. You can also see some hints of that in the armor scattered around the battlefield. And that's just as Kale and Morgana look up towards the sky where Aatrox is waiting. Now of course, many of you may know that in game, Kale has two swords. And Morgana is the mage who roots you for the entire game. So Bro. how come Kale has one sword and Morgana has the other one? Well, before Kale and Morgana became the twin aspects of justice, it was their mother, Mira, who held that title. And who served justice around the world while wielding a celestial blade. Later in her life, she decided to pass her powers onto her two twin daughters. And so she split her blade and she gave one half to each of them. It wasn't until the conflict a bit later that Morgana essentially quit her job as an aspect and she gave her blade to Kale. So at the time of this cinematic, the two still serve as the twin aspects. E Holy shit. Bro, I didn't even notice. I forgot. Yeah, Morgana doesn't have a sword. <laughs> I didn't even think about that, bro. Each wielding one half of a celestial blade. Another cool detail here is that as the two leap into the sky after Aatrox, you can see how Kale leads the charge with righteousness, with Morgana being the one who simply follows her. That's because Kale okay, always a... looked up to their mother and what they... That's, that's kind of a stretch, but okay. For, while Morgana was always wary of their newfound powers. That's why in this entire cinematic, Morgana looks a bit more cautious. And before Morgana flies off into the distance too, for the last time, we have some time to see just how tribal Demacia looked at one point. Though, even during this time, you can agree, see that Juan. some of the buildings already started shaping up. After which, of course, the Battle of Aatrox and the Twin Aspect. Yeah, Jackson, League of Legends Thor is on another level. It, honestly, it's because their cinematics are just... The cinematics make you invested in the lore. I only cared about StarCraft II lore because the cinematics made me go, All right, baby, we're taking Iyer back. Let's go pound some ass. You know what I mean? League of Legends cinematics are goaded, man. These are so good. Like, if you have good cinematics, people give a shit about the lore in your game because they become emotionally invested, man. It's so important. Starts. Unfortunately, there is not much to mention here. It is just a cool fight of flying demigods. But eventually, Aatrox smacks both of them to the ground. Their side of the fight starts looking grim, and Aatrox quickly follows them down. After his epic entry, you can actually see more of his followers charging forward in the background. Yep. After which we get another cool reference. As Morgana stands up, she takes her sword and stabs it to the ground, leaving it behind. All in Garzar Morgana. I get it now. As she I... focuses on her magic. This is foreshadowing for how later on Morgana gives up on the legacy of their mother. Now, yes. of course, this wouldn't get a full approval from Kale, who always idealized their mother. And so, when she looks up with a frown, you can see the cinematic gives us a scene where Morgana is getting rid of her armor, all while being framed by the sword which she left behind. Jesus Christ, bro. Yo, they killed this. They fucking, the detail in this cinematic is out of this world. Stuff I didn't even notice. And then, of course... And I know a good amount about League lore. Holy shit, dude. And this is why Arcane did so well? Oh, yeah, I know. Like, I played both Jinx and Vi. I was a Jinx main when I was an AD carry maid, and then I main Vi in the... I main Vi is one of my main carries in the jungle. I'm my second best jungler. I love that. I was so glad when Arcane was based around those two for the first season. I'm very excited to see where it's going to be in the second one. We get to see Morgana wield her dark magic. Now, I say dark, but in reality, it is celestial in origin. Morgana is not evil or anything like that. In fact, she is far better at protecting the people of Demacia than Kale. But that's a whole another story. 
and so she uses her celestial chains to bind Aatrox to the ground, an obvious reference to her Q ability in the game, which is for- I don't know, I felt like it kind of felt like Soul Shackles. Um, I felt- what, isn't Soul Shackles her ultimate? Uh, I'm not- I forget what her Q is, because Dark Binding? It was R? Okay, yeah, I mean, I felt like it was so, like Soul Shackles, not Dark Binding. Yeah. Followed by Kale picking up Morgana's sword. Again, this is not only a reference to what Kale looks like in game, but it is also a reference to the fact that later down in her story, she does actually claim Morgana's sword. Her. And by doing that, she fully embraces their mother's legacy. This is also why when Kale Again, they're shackles, so like it makes sense. Walks by Morgana, she wants a Oh my god, bro, that's what the face is for. Holy shit and proves that she's the jerk and Morgana is the good one. When she gives her that disapproving look, it is not only directed at the fact that Morgana is using magic in Demacia. Look at that face! Look at that face, bro! Morgana is pouring her heart out right now, carrying your ass. You're welcome, by the way, bitch. You're fucking welcome, you entitled bitch. I've been holding this guy here for 16 levels, waiting for your ass to be ready to do anything relevant. Holy shit. During those times, it was not ideal, but they were kind of forced into it. More than that, Kale is simply disappointed by the fact that Morgana would dare to leave their mother's sword behind. Especially if she's doing that to only focus on her magic. That's the real point of this scene. After which, even though Morgana carried the crap out of this fight, using both blades, Kale uses her passive ability from the game. She literally just auto attacks him. You're fucking welcome. Classic carry getting all the credit. Morgana literally hard carrying her as usual. Supports are underrated. Upon the righteous flames and she burns Aatrox. The funny part here is that uh, after this fight is over, Kale has to kind of awkwardly walk back to Morgana and give her the blade back. Because I uh, That's kind of awkward. I mean, uh, the awkward part is when you hit him with that, and then it's like a... Bro, she hits him with this epic ability. It's just crazy, and it... Did zero fucking damage because Aatrox has, like, infinite HP and sustain. You hit him like a wet noodle. Again, this scene is not how Kale claimed Morgana's sword. Uh, that happens later. Anyway, this is where the final awesome detail of the story happens. First of all, when the Righteous Flame burns Aatrox, for only a single second, you can see that Aatrox dropped his sword. Since he is a Darkin, this indicates that his soul went back to the blade. But what's in- Never mind, Kale's busted. Literally one tap that freak. Interesting is that in this scene, it might be the first time Aatrox got ever sealed. The vast majority of the Darkin got sealed at the end of the Darkin War, where a celestial aspect came down and helped mortals seal everyone. Would you rather lose your sister to magic or date Dilly for six months? I'm gonna say lose my sister to magic. Easy peasy. But some of the Darkin successfully fled away. And it was mentioned was that Aatrox was one of them. And since this is happening sometime after the Darkin Wars were already over, it is possible that this is the moment Aatrox got caught. Because we know that he had to get sealed eventually. Because later he gets picked up by another soldier and he gets his entire story with Trindamir and Pantheon. So this- Ah, uh, somebody else pick up the sword! Yo, somebody, somebody get it. Somebody stronger this time. Nobody skipping tricep workouts. This might be a lot more of a historical moment than most people might imagine. Anyway, even cooler than this are the last few frames from this scene. Once again, you can see a mysterious figure standing on one leg holding a bow. With oh my fucking god, no way. Did anyone notice that? How did this dude notice that? This guy went through this frame by frame. Holy shit. Bro, that's crazy. Notice what? Oh, 
which is the iconic pose of yeah it, those are definitely legs those are definitely legs you can definitely see them walking like holy shit the lamb representing death Oh my god, dude, that's nuts! This one has some absolutely awesome implications. You see, the reason why Aatrox is extra evil and he is driven by slaughter is because he just wants to die. He hates his corrupted form. He hates the blood magic bind. Is this game any good? League of Legends is great if you're playing with friends. Uh, it's a descent into madness, though, so just bear that in mind. Ding him. But it just so happens to be that the Darkin are immortal. He is simply never going to escape this prison. His end always waits for him inside his weapon. Uh, which psycho, is not why for you, Aatrox simply wants to destroy- You don't have any friends? Um, two things. First thing, uh, install Black Desert Online. Uh, second thing, uh, twitch.tv slash subcaitlin. Destroy the entire world. In his mind, that would be the only way to end this suffering. He can't be imprisoned if there is no prison. And because he's she will immortal, be your friend, you can see the lamp in the fire. But she's simply watching him, not doing anything. Because death can't claim Aatrox. And then... Oh my... I was about to say, he's just locked away. He, he didn't die though. But that's true. It's just... Kindred is always just edging. Can't actually claim him. So close. And the cinematic cuts to perhaps the most badass part. No, this that's is the where next one. all the major talks happened. So well, we know who the Yasuo main is. Let's break it down. Of course, this scene takes us to Ionia. However, this is Ionia course, naturally. about 30 to 40 years in the future from the present days. Take it for what it is for now. We'll explain this time skip later. Here we can see some bandits burning a village. They are wearing masks, which of course are very popular in Ionia because they are connected to legends and demons. And at first, this made me think that these might be related to the Shadow Order. But as you'll see later, there is no shadow magic to be seen here. So these are far more likely to be related to Navori, which is a group of a little bit too patriotic Ionians who are not afraid of attacking other Ionians if they don't share their views. That's also why you can see that they are attacking other Ionians here. That's crazy. In America, we call those Texans. And after this, a mysterious man with a staff draws a line in the dirt. This is a hypothetical line as well as a literal one. It Weeb simply Lord tells them to not go just subscribe. Yo, Weeb Lord, thanks for the brand new T1 sub, man. I really appreciate that. Thanks so much. Nothing makes me wetter than a new T1 sub. That's what we have the wet floor signs for. So that nobody slips. I love how this cinematic thanks, can tell Weeb, us all of it. this without saying a word. A very common theme in this entire cinematic. Anyway, the two bandits laugh at the drawn line. We get a bit of a western standoff. After which, in an extremely subtle way, the cinematic reveals who this man is. Up you already to this know. Point, when I first you already know. This, I wasn't sure if this was Elder Suma or Master Doran. But in fact, with a very slight tilt of his head, the scene reveals the scar on his face which always belong. Holy shit. I have to say, I never noticed the scar on Yasuo's face. Typically because he's always respawning at the fountain and I can never get a good look at him. But that's a crazy detail. To Yasuo. And this is where things get absolutely wild. When the bandits attack, you can see that Yasuo is not using his sword. In fact, his sword is no... Yeah, I thought maybe it was Jax for a second. You know, because Jax is not allowed to actually use a weapon. ...to be seen around him. But what's more interesting... Blasphemer, we're breaking down... This is the new League of Legends cinematic, but they're breaking down all the lore and stuff. Thing, ...he is not even using the wind technique. And that's because Yasuo has a very clear purpose in how he's fighting them here. If you look closely, you can see that he's not killing anyone. And the reason for this is very simple. Yasuo has been murdering people with wind his entire life. And if you really... Including himself and his own teammates. 
and my self-confidence in solo queue look into his story you might notice that the wind never brought anything good into his life in fact using the wind technique i agree people suspect it's never brought anything good into my master. life either so the wind is the reason why he got exiled from his home so it wouldn't be too far-fetched to believe that yasuo was simply done with using the wind especially if it was taking lives and you'll see that all of this is heavily reinforced in this entire scene of course, during this fight, without the wind or his blade, you can see the bandits actually manage to knock Yasuo down, where he faces the option to use the blade. Here people should notice that this is not Yasuo's blade. It is the blade of one of the bandits, which Yasuo knocked out of their hand earlier on. Now, as Yasuo... Oh, uh, I was wondering how the sword got there. What's the highest rank you got in League? I was Diamond. Diamond 4. Oh, looks up. You can see the shock in his face. This that's what I say, Rurouni Kenshin. Yeah, where he turns like the blade over or whatever, but like that's not this. It, 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 Kenshin did have like the vow. Of, it's the one anime that I actually know about. He did take a vow to not actually hurt people. Although in that final episode, he turns the blade over and you get a little wet. When he realized that without his wind technique, he can't protect this village. After which, the cinematic reveals some more. Diamond 4 with 500 games. Fuck you, I got it in 67 games. The season that I got D4, I got. I did it in 67 games. I speed ran it. I just played Evelyn every game, straight to D4, and then I played my other junglers the rest of the season and just fucked around. Or bandits with their boss in the middle. Although, unfortunately, this is entirely new character, so there is... No but yeah, I was hard stuck plat for most of it. Nothing to mention here. And then we got the beautiful scene where Yasuo faces his destiny. First of all, he still has the bottle on him, so he is still an alcoholic, even at his respect. Motherfucker come to, came to lane with some potions. That's right. Because you know you're going to get hit. The melee in the mid lane, you're asking for it. Double A. Some Nico motherfucker is going to start just auto attacking you to death. But also he drops his staff, which indicates that he's done pretending to be someone he's not. After which the leader signals the archers. Until the very last moment, you can see that Yasuo does not want to do it. But eventually, he picks up the blade to defend himself. And not only is he defending himself by physically using the blade, but also by using it to channel the wind and making the iconic wind wall. Here, the cinematic is actually showing us that he can use the wind wall on purpose. It is not just a cool reference to his ability in the game. This one has a wild payoff. We'll get to that one in a moment. Next... You mean he can use it to actually help my team? What the fuck? As Yasuo runs forward, he finally fully channels the wind. But again, notice that he is not killing anyone with it. He seemingly only glances past their enemies as they drop down. Who cares you threw your promos? What rank were you again? Sit down. Okay. Sit down. You washed up Silver League 80 carry bitch. Without a single Ezreal drop abuser. Blood. At the beginning, it is not clear what is exactly happening, but then there is the one that shows us what he's doing. Knock the bandits down. He is not drawing blood, and he is not killing I'll them. look at it after this. This is such a cool way to show us that even though Yasuo is once again forced to embrace the wind, he is not willing to use it to murder anyone. He you know, I noticed that. I didn't see any blood or anything, so he's actually using the wind so that the blade doesn't actually hit them. That's crazy. He is simply done with killing. Another cool detail here is that as Yasuo unleashes the wind, the binding on his arm actually rips. A reference to the fact that he's being unleashed again. After which, we get to the beautiful payoff. After a bit of chasing, at the end, Yasuo is faced with a cloud of arrows coming for him. This would be a sure kill to Yasuo as well as. So that was what my Yasuo oh my on my team it's... was doing. We're done. So I suspect that he channeled the tornado Jesus. to knock the leader away on purpose. Again, Holy he fuck. is not drawing blood, so he pushed him away so he wouldn't get hit. Which leads us to the payoff itself. Bro, I'm engrossed in the lore. As Yasuo looks up, he can see the cloud of arrows, which is something Yasuo has... I didn't even know. Are those arrows? Those look like ashes. Those aren't arrows. 
Those are ashes. Those are definitely ashes. Now this, though, I didn't notice these eyes right here. I don't know. Is that Kinder to get it? There's no shot. It's faced many times before. In fact, if you go back to the climb cinematic from five years ago, you'll see that in Ionia, he was once again faced with the exact same scenario. And what did he do? This is the climb cinematic. Um... Windwall. Of course, he summoned the wind wall to protect himself. Yes, I do believe Don't this cool is down. what the still here cinematic is referencing. It is supposed to show us that Yasuo has a way out of this scenario. All he needs to do is to make a wind wall. So... It's a 30 second cooldown, there's still a way. Does he do it? No. We know that he can do it because the 15, cinematic actually, purposefully showed it to us earlier on. But he still doesn't do it and instead he willingly embraces his own end. Which is indicated by the eyes of the wolf, which you can see in the distance. That is as crazy. As well as the arrow of death coming from Lamb. That's where that came from? That's where that came from? Bro, I had no idea, bro. I was wondering, I was like, dude, what was that light arrow? It's kind of a weird transition. That's insane. That's Kindred's arrow. Holy shit. He gets Lamb's arrow because he embraces death instead of running. Yeah, that's crazy. They kind of do look like more like arrows now. So yes, Yasuo dies in this scene. And it is perhaps the most badass death he could have asked for. Now, here we need to point out an interesting thing. After this cinematic came out, there was an article by Dot Esports where they got to interview the creative directors of this cinematic. And here it was confirmed that uh, they need a raise. This was a vision given to Yasuo by Kindred themselves. Also, if you go into the description of the cinematic, you'll see that this is a... So he's not actually dead, it was a dream. Possible future. Possible which made future. many people think that this is a what-if scenario. It is not Yasuo's real death, and it is just what could happen okay. if Yasuo goes down a certain path. Well, I propose this is real. And Riot just chickened out. And they wanted to have the doors open just in case they want to do something else in the future. No, I think this is how Yasuo dies. In fact, he must die like this. See, based on a bunch of different stories, we know that while League of Legends only has one true timeline, there are ways for people to look across time into a bunch of different what-if scenarios. For example, Zillion's story is all about looking into a bunch of different potential outcomes of their universe. Though that doesn't mean that the other universes are real. They are just windows into possibilities. But that's... I do want to point out that I love how, like, lore-specific it actually is, because, like, Yasuo dying in the cinematic is exactly what all of us have been experiencing with Yasuo's on our team for the last fucking 11 years. He even dies in the fucking cinematic. He looked like a badass doing it, but like he died again. Motherfucker got straight back to the fountain again. What those are, they are hypothetical windows. They are not real. In the real timeline, a future foreseen cannot be changed. This was always heavily implied with Olaf. That's right. Olaf is a Freljordian warrior who got a prophecy from a shaman. This mo Olaf never skips leg day. I'm gonna, I'm just gonna, uh, bro. Woo. A prophecy that one day he's gonna die of old age in his bed. He was in the last cinematic. Um, the call. He was in the call cinematic. Of course, Olaf refused to believe in that. He was certain he would die a glorious death in battle. And so, ever since that day, Olaf traveled around the world and he looked for the most powerful enemies to fight. From giant kraken worms, which consumed entire ships, to undead kings with their undead armies. Olaf fought all of it, and most of them alone. And he always survived. 
because every time he got close to death, Alpha. a mysterious frenzy took over his body and he came out victorious. All because of his foreseen prophecy that said that he's gonna die old. And he can't change that. Which I did not know that. I do know that Olaf's passive, um, when he loses health, he does more damage. Like a lot more damage. Which means that as long as he's fighting, he's immortal. Now, of course, Riot could always go back and retcon parts of Olaf's story. Ragnarok. At least that enough. would be for the sake of... Ragnarok is his ult, though. He just busts through all CCs and goes into, like, this rage and then dies with his head forward like an idiot. He puts his helmet on. Asuo getting a better story later on. But honestly, I kind of hope they don't. Because Yasuo's dead... Hey, Diamond, why don't you know this is lore, man? I know I know a lot about... Like like I said, I know Olaf's abilities and passives and stuff, but, like, I don't... I don't like his lore and stuff? I don't know is badass and i hope they commit to it one day now before we move on from yasuo's storyline here some people theorized about the background here you can see that all of this is happening beside some snowy mountains now ionia does have some snowy mountains in the north holy but shit pine trees are not exactly typical for it Correct. this is why some people believe that this entire scene is not happening in ionia but rather this is in the Freljord, which would indicate that during the second invasion of Ionia, what? which was an event teased to happen many times in the past. Frost, but Irelia. This is the Awakened cinematic, arguably until this cinematic, the best cinematic Riot had ever released. Noxus might either take over Ionia or entirely annihilate it, forcing Ionians to travel out into other regions. So who knows? Maybe this cinematic is also teasing a very dark future for Ionians. But finally, this takes us into the final part of this cinematic. Trindamir's battle with death. Here we it go. It immediately starts a with a cool detail. Just like the first scene started with a view looking down on Trindamir, indicating him descending down towards death. Oh the yeah, see, he has all the barbarians around him. There's no Kidrid. Look at the, look, he's got barbarians everywhere, basically, closing in around him. Trindamir, indicating him descending down towards death. The second part starts with a view up, indicating that he's rising up again. Now first things first, why is Trindamir alive here? The reason is Aatrox again. What? Yes, later in his story, roughly about a thousand years after his part with Kale and Morgana, Aatrox invades Trindamir's tribe and he stabs Trindamir with the blade infusing him with blood magic in the process. In theory, it is possible that Aatrox did this to turn Trindamir into a worthy host later on. The thing is, you know how Aatrox is immortal and always bound to his weapon? Yeah, by infusing Trindamir with blood magic, he also cursed him with the undying rage, turning Trindamir immortal too. We still don't know the limits of Trindamir's immortality. But we know that death is not gonna have a great time with him. So. That's crazy. This scene does not happen too long after the first one. You'll see there is some evidence that shows us that this is only a few minutes or seconds after the first scene. It all starts with a snowflake that falls down onto his blade and immediately gets absorbed into it. This is because Trindamir is an iceborn. And his yeah. blade is infused with true ice. True. Which is a Freljordian magical kind of ice that originates from the Yeti magic. And then after new, Trindamir new. stands up, he gets ready to face death. And based on the fact that he is not surprised at all, this is not the first time he's doing this. Now, of course, the lamb... Not this motherfucker again. ...is often not alone. And so Trindamir also gets an epic fight with the wolf. The fight itself is absolutely gorgeous. And sometimes you get amazing shots such as this one. With CGI on such a stunning level, Trindamir just looks like a real human being. He does look but real. yes, he deflects arrows from the lamp and fights off the wolf. Because today is not his day. Another thing to point out here is that the wolf... And what do we say to the god of death? Sit down, pussy. Wolf has feet which he normally doesn't. That's a cool detail. And yes, eventually, Trindamir's undying rage kicks in. 
which is when you can start noticing some more details. First of all, when Trindamir charges the lamb, it is awesome to see the wolf dash in to protect her. But then Trindamir actually gets to shatter her bow, which immediately reforms back in her hand, because you can't stop death. In this scene, you can also see the lamp slightly... Oh, you can in about five seconds. You, you'll be able to stop the shit out of death. Yeah, you'll stop that shit dead. And it's fine. You hit that some bitch with an ash arrow, you stop the fuck out of death. Tilt her head in curiosity. It is for anyone that doesn't know, Kindred's ult uh, is like an immortality circle. No one in the circle can die for about six seconds. Obvious, the lamp and the wolf came here to claim Trindamir's life. But now they realize this might not be possible, which is where the confusion comes from. Immediately after that, the wolf bites into Trindamir's shoulder. And you'll see that from that point on, the shoulder pad actually stays damaged. This is an important detail, so pay attention to it. What? And to really just say screw you when the lamp tries to snipe Trindamir in the back, he just casually parries the arrow with his hand as the undying rage goes on. The fight then continues for a little bit longer, before the lamp finally decides that today is not Trindamir's day. After which we get two arrows from Ash flying by her. Which is a slight reference to Ash's volley ability. Told you! Y'all said it was their ult. It's the volley. For sure. Into two Winter's Claw warriors behind Trindamir. Which is kept off with the image of the lamb dissolving into Ash. Trindamir's oath-sworn wife who came in to rescue him. That's right. The two are married. Although That's at right. first they just got married for political reasons. The love came. And then they realized that their sex was really good later now this dissolving image is actually hinting at what is really happening here especially when you combine it with the fact that in the next scene trindamir's shoulder pad is still damaged despite the damaging being caused by the wolf which supposedly happened in the death realm well in theory this would show you that all of this was only happening in trindamir's head while in his mind he was fighting death itself. In reality, in the outside world, Trindamir was fighting the other warriors of the Winter's Claw. This would be why the damage on his shoulder pad stayed physical. It was actually caused by his real enemies. This is fucking crazy. He just imagined them to look like the wolf. What weapon makes that kind of a mark? And on top of that, I do believe that's why the image of the lamb dissolved into ash. It was all to show us that Trindamir only imagined his enemies to look like the lamb and the wolf. And when ash Ash showing up because they already got bot tower. So get, get down bottom, bitch. We already won our lane. Arrived, she broke the illusion. To really confirm that this is what happened, you can go back to the very beginning of this cinematic for another detail. When Trindamir was laying there at the brink of death, when he looked into the distance, despite many people believing that this was the lamb, now we know this was more likely just Ash, and she was only seconds away from him. The thing is, in that scene, Trindamir was surrounded by six other warriors. But when Ash arrived, she only killed two of them, despite the field already being clean. The cinematic specifically zooms out to show us that everyone's dead. Which means Jesus fucking Christ, bro. This is crazy. Trindamir did kill- I love Kindred. She's so badass. How dare you use the wrong pronoun in 2024. It's they. They, them for Kindred. Gosh, how could you be so insensitive? The rest of the warriors while in his undying rage. Which finally brings us to the final scene where Ash shoots her hawk eye into the sky to signal the Avarosans to come in and pick them up. You can see that this is in fact her hawk eye because the arrow actually turns into a hawk. Yep. It also gets the sound effect and it reveals that there are more warriors coming for them. And so this is the still here cinematic exp I was waiting for him to get into the closing screen and be like, and here we see the teaser for the next champ. I'm like, what the fuck? Blame. I absolutely love this one, because every time you watch it, you notice something new. We spent three hours going through this on stream to make sure that we really pick up most of the details. 
but I wouldn't be surprised if more things were still coming up. Massive shout out to Riot for actually giving us a fully canonical cinematic, which did wonders to the community. Though I have to point out, there were some issues with this cinematic. Oh no. Yasuo draws a line in the dirt, but mysteriously in the next scene it disappears, and Ash. Oh my! Unplayable. Thumbs down. Fucking ridiculous. Kills two people with her arrows, but later on you can only see one. Zero out of Jesus. Then this cinematic is ruined. <laughs> Crazy, bro. Actually, just crazy, bro. Here's the video right here. Holy shit. Make sure you go give him a thumbs up. He's the he's the hero we need because let's be honest, none of the rest of us are actually going to know any of that shit. Let's just be honest with each other.